Here we go. We're live. <clears throat> awesome. We're live. So we had some technical difficulties. Yeah. It's sorted now. It's sorted now. We figured it out. So welcome everyone Brown. to the show Witch Bitch where we talk the real tea. Today we have my dad on, um, Spencer Jones. He is a singer, a songwriter, and has been in the music industry since he was basically a teenager. So today um, we'll be talking about a lot of things, but the, you know, main theme of today's topic is the... Oh, oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was just <laughs> checking that we were actually live on, on Facebook. <laughs> Yeah, the main theme of today is the power of music. So welcome, Dad, to the show. Um, Thanks for having I me. Think the first it's question that we kind of... <laughs> so um, the main question that we kind of ask everyone um, first off is what is your awakening journey? Um, well, I'm still on mine, very much so. But... Uh, my my beginning of my awakening was uh when we set up a foundation for you when we were raising money for motor neurone disease back in when was that 2015 um all the th all the questions that were asked when we when we set that up and that lady that we met that helped us set it up was like hang on a minute this is how we're all supposed to be operating so i kind of woke up backwards as in it not being a spiritual awakening to start with it was more of a um how the finance system works and how how the banking system is all sort of backwards so that was the beginning of uh, my awakening was because of what you did as an 11 year old and and i started asking questions um and then subsequently after that i, I went on a man's retreat with james green shields and i had a uh, a bit of a massive spiritual awakening there in the bush after th three days of intense sort of men's workshop and meditation and and uh as you know i saw all those beautiful orbs <laughs> and uh, it was like okay there's more to this realm than meets the eye so that was my next that was when i realized that you know we weren't alone that's when i realized that there was you know more more dimensions and more to this 3d world than than we live in and then mums mm. yeah that was pretty full-on experience actually i wish you could i wish i could take people there because <laughs> that was really full-on that was actually it was awesome and then it reminded me when i that moment when i saw all the orbs um i knew that they were spirits um ancestor it was it was ancestral it was a, it was a feeling of it was indigenous feeling actually it was like it was uh lineages of spirits dancing all happy it was it was nothing sinister there was no no darkness to it whatsoever it was all beautiful i i cried like a baby I remember saying to James, I said, is this happening? And he said, it is for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then that made me realize um, things I used to see as a kid um, when I was 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, when I used to, when I grew up in a little place called Shaftesbury, which I now subsequently know is a very important place globally it's uh it's actually called the spear of purpose which is it's aligned with glastonbury it's part of the, the glastonbury um, earth sh chakra um 
and when I was when I was a kid, I remember I used to see little people when I was in the well in, in Australia we called the bush, but that was called the cops. When they would be little uh we call them snowdrops, little flowers and little wild garlic flowers. And I used to go walking, looking for rabbits and I used to see the see fairies and I used to think that it was my imagination, but I used to see them in the corner of my eye and they'd run off. And I know that they were real. I know it was a another dimension or so I've always been sort of tapped into it, but obviously chose to ignore it. And then later, when Claudia um, showed me that David Icke video that, that where the penny drop for, for, for Claudia was like a, another penny drop for me. So, so Mr. Icke kind of was like, okay, there's something going on here. And then when Trump was in, the, the silly things that he was saying was all part of my awakening. It was just like, he's trying to tell us something and you know, you, you know we've all been down rabbit holes and i've been down many and tr have to drag yourself out so yeah that's really the the crux of my awakening really was kind of a bit backwards through you and through setting up the the uh, csj lemonade when you were raising money for motor neurons and then through james and that spiritual experience in the bush that would have been 2016, yeah, 17 maybe, and then yeah, so that's it really. I'm still still on still on awakening path now. Mm. Yeah, yeah, constantly constantly awakening. You know, um, I've got yeah. There's never really years. an end. Once you wake up, it's there's forever never going. An end. No, yeah. you feel the same. Mm, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's always growth to be to be had. There's mm. always room to grow. There's always ways to expand yourself. There's always a shadow to overcome <laughs> and, mm, and go yeah. through. <laughs> but yeah, I um, I wanted to. It's actually I've got a good segue now because Ooh. you mentioned about um the Aboriginal orbs, like the Indigenous mm. orbs in the forest. And yeah. this leads into, you know, topics about music. And you're probably wondering, how does that have to do with music? But I really wanted to touch on, you know, with this power of music, to touch on the ancient side of it and, and start there and then go through to eventually your experience, Dad, with mm. music. But... Yeah. um. I've been doing some research about, you know, Indigenous music and, you know, how they really connected with their instruments and, and the whole music side of, of their culture. And yep. um, song lines was a big thing that I was looking into. And something that I didn't realise about Aboriginal song lines is it's actually like a fishing net. So there's so many lines that they kind of cross they crisscross over each other. Like a wave. Yeah. And right. they literally use song, like they're they're singing as a map to know where things mm. are based on the song yeah. lines. Wow. So say you're a, you know, back in uh before colonization happened in Australia and you're yeah. um an Aboriginal. And you're on a journey to go to another tribe. You would go along the song lines and sing a certain song, and it would be a specific song. And when you reach a certain point in the song, like a certain moment, that marks where you're at. I love that. So, wow. like, yeah. That's amazing. So when you're like at a certain point, you know that's the marker. Mm. It's like a sign, but you're singing it. Yeah. And so that's how they would find their way around. And so, what, what would, they, would that? Sorry to interrupt. So, no. so, those song lines would they would that lead them to maybe a specific food or a certain point where they have to, like a spiritual space or water? Yeah, each would have its meaning, surely. Yeah. So, 
I think when it comes to food, like I don't know, I didn't go that deep into okay. it. Um, and also with with this sort of stuff, it is um, very much protected by modern day Aboriginals because they don't want to, you know, like bleed out their knowledge into just the Western Anyone. world. So yeah. the knowledge is pretty closed off from like Google and stuff. But what the main thing that I got from my research was that the lines of the song lines represent like trade routes, like the path of the right. of the thing. But the diamonds in the in the middle that would form from the crisscross, they are represented of locations. So a tribe would be the yeah right the diamond in that forms the crisscross. So it was mainly to connect aboriginals like from different tribes it was to connect tribes but i i do believe that of course like it would some of those diamonds would be a spiritual you know sacred space or a cave yeah. or you know maybe even uluru might be a yeah you know um a diamond so yeah it was just a way it was a way to connect all the tribes together because they all speak different dialects and different languages, that, so song would be a way to travel and communicate and yeah. connect. Connection just, again. Mm, yeah, connection. And oh, sorry, you go. No, it's just it's just another form of connection through music. It, it's you know a map. Mm. A map is yeah. connection too. You know map of life a map of experiences a spiritual map it's kind of what music yeah. does kind of maps through your emotions even modern music which has all been <clears throat> you know um hijacked like we we tune into uh music used to be tuned down into uh 432 hertz and they changed the frequency now to 440 which is less connecting than 432. Mm. 432 is not really the the uh, the tuning of nature, but it's closer to it, and it does something in the in the in the resonance of of your soul. Um, Jimi Hendrix tuned to E flat, Stevie Ray Vaughan, a lot of bands of old, and a lot of um, a lot of old composers and um, like Mozart, he would he would tune to the frequency of something outside. So he would yeah. write a whole piece, and it would be to the tune of whatever was he was hearing. So, so he was connecting with nature. Yeah. Now we use a tuner to tune to four forty, which is a kind of frequency of nothing really modern pop it's music, a disruptive so. um frequency isn't it it's kind of like a yes. blocking disruptive yes. yeah it separates us from the <laughs> feeling of spirit yeah, well, I, I, yeah. I, I tune into when i when i do my gigs and when i write original songs i always tune down to 432 because it just resonates with me more and I yeah. feel that I can connect better when I'm in that space. Mm. And I've always done that, even before I was, uh, even in my early original bands, we always tuned down to E-flat. So I kind of always knew I wasn't awake. Or, yeah, right. Uh, as you would say, I probably was awake. I just didn't know I was awake. But, mm. but yeah, you had the feelings. Then, yeah. Yeah, the wow. thing was happening, yeah. Yeah, so... It's interesting. Well, with um, with um, Native American culture, because that was another one that I researched. They were the two that I researched. They do the, uh, well because you know music in in those cultures. You don't really have a tuner, like you, you no. don't have instruments that have strings and and keys and things like that. They had drums. They instead of tuning to you know a frequency of sound. They would mm. do the same thing, but 
they would instead tune to the heartbeat of Mother Earth. Oh, beautiful. So through a specific what? rhythm of mm-hmm. their drum, that's how they would connect to um, Mother Earth's heartbeat. And in their beliefs, and now I'm not saying all tribes beliefs because you know all different tribes have different beliefs Mm. but as a common belief um the sound of mother earth's heartbeat was the first sound in existence Mm. and um, i love that that's amazing and they tune themselves and to them the drum is a female and is a human spirit like it's a human thing and has its own consciousness yeah yeah and um the reason why it's female is because the drum in ancient times this is their again not all beliefs but just the story that i've read online is that um the women gave the drum to the men so they could tune in to mother nature in a way that came naturally to women yeah so like in um ceremony and stuff women don't usually go near the drum or play the drum um they just watch and the men are are doing the drum because it was a gift from women to men right yeah so that was really interesting that makes perfect sense Mm. that makes sense yeah that feels right in my heart what you were just saying there yeah it's funny how um mother nature holds the power and it's definitely the sacred feminine for sure mm. it holds that uh it holds that knowledge and that power within yeah. earth 100%. as a gift to everyone both yeah. men and women yeah for sure mm. Mm. yeah i mean like you go across the board and i've only just started going down this rabbit hole like this is maybe an hour of research and um, I've gone into, you know, a very surface level, you know, knowledge that you can just yeah. Google mm. and find. I mean, don't go just on you- Google. I go on other search engines because Google yeah. is very sensory and, like, won't show you the real information. But, yeah. um, like, Pythagoras, the Greek philosopher, he was the one who um, discovered that when you put uh your finger and shorten the length of a string it changes the key all right so like how in guitar and and ukulele and and string instruments he discovered that the length of the string changes the sound and he was a big believer in music is is the answer to the universe and like holds all the frequency yes and like music is a mirror of all these all of them are are you know tesla all the greek mythologies it's all it's all based around frequency mm. and vibration frequency. yeah because yeah. it transcends language doesn't it because it That's speaks right. into well, it your language it's its soul. own language yeah but it's more than language because it's a feeling too mm. it it brings in so much more um energy into the body it 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 communicates with your body and it creates a feeling inside which is why music is so beautiful and everybody loves it mm. because it's yeah. it kind yeah. of it envelops you as a, as a as a person as a soul it envelops you mm. so does. and it kind mm. of and it kind of is you i mean i feel i feel modern day um like presently now it's not quite the same but throughout the the centuries like music definitely molded generations do you know what i mean there was things that happened in timelines like it was always a 10-year spell you know there was soul and then there was blues and there was rock and then there was Mm. pop and then there was punk it kind of it kind of made you who you were do you know what I mean? The, the generations of people. It's it's not quite like that anymore. I don't think so. I mean, I could be wrong, but uh, you know, back in if you were into rock, you were into rock. Do you know what I mean? It was kind of labelled you. It, was, it connected to that music. Did something, stirred something in your soul, and it, and it you connected with it, or 
you could have been into soul it did something inside you and it made you express yourself it made you it brought you into that genre of uh frequency and music and made you who you were you would then dress that way and you would express yourself that way and dance that way and uh we've kind of lost that a little bit mm. um i think there's quite a few kids now that kind of feel that and are sort of tapping into it it's how's it been how lost do you think what what what's in your mind how did we lose it from a slightly negative i don't want to be negative but i think it's just basically was hijacked by the industry they real and, and the governments they realized that it was giving people too much power so you think that it's connection. more controlled now yeah they they, they don't like people mm. having that kind of connection and being yeah. a, being a group you know it has the potential to unite people to, to build a big group of people that are mm. like-minded people that are all yeah we like this mm. and you know, look at Woodstock and look at that kind of yeah. power. I was going to say, that was what I was going to say, Woodstock your mind. Yeah, well, a you know, example of that. But, you know, Woodstock's a perfect example. But festivals subsequently after that, you know, even the modern festivals up to the big day out and and Donington and Nebworths and the Isle of Wight, people that, you know, the governments don't like people connecting on that level where there's 70,000, 120,000 people or like-minded gathered together talking mm. talking about ideas and spirituality and you know glastonbury festival is now a commercial mess you know that used to be talking about we'll talk about glastonbury festival because i grew up in shaftesbury and glastonbury used to be called pilton festival and all the hippies and the caravans it was a real real hippie festival in its infancy and they used to travel from london and they were travelers and they would come through shaftesbury and we would all clap them and welcome them into the town and they would stop in different towns along the way to go to this festival which was predominantly a real hippie festival and it was hippie bands and very sort of left the field what i i would say and um i had friends that went there and never came back you know what i mean I, I remember a friend of mine pete um he decided to join the the caravan the, the you know the the walk to glastonbury festival and we never saw him again he he, he joined the travelers and he traveled europe he went to the uh what do they call it the turkey and took magic mushrooms and all that stuff he was he was away with the fairies for oh i think five years until we saw him again you know that's what that festival represented at the very very infancy of it all and now it's just a corporate kylie minogue plays there it's just like what's going on you know <laughs> it's just a commercial so it's lost name. its soul is that what you're saying it's lost its soul, lost its soul. Yeah, yeah. totally I mean, it's still a good, it's still a good festival, and it still has its place. But corporate, mm. corporate England got its mitts in it, and the industry saw it for what it, you know, the power that it financially it could bring. And it's just not the same. That's mm. not how it started. And uh, I was, I never actually went to Glastonbury, but I was fortunate enough to sort of see it for what it was. You know what I mean? It was just like, yeah, this is really because it happened every year, and it would be like, here they come, the the pikeys and the hippies are coming through town, and they'd spend money, and then there'd be some locals would be whinging, you know, and they're camping out because they camp up on, on Park Walk where I grew up, and but they were always very dignified they cleaned up after themselves and just moved on and slept a few nights and to recuperate and they you know it was awesome and uh wow that's the power of music that's what that's what music 
it for them they they walked and traveled miles like london's mm. they come from london from up north they'd all you know all down the major artery roads until they got to glastonbury and then there'd be like seventy thousand people there all smoking pot and <laughs> having a good time yeah, so. yeah and then it turned into something else pretty much overnight yeah. you know it didn't take long to sort of for it to get corrupted once the financial institutions and the and the music industry got their mitts in it it didn't take long for the Kylie Minogue to be headlining it yeah so it's cool yeah I think um the music industry and what it is today is like it's kind of the center of all of Hollywood because mm. music connects with music, uh, with movies. It connects with, you know, obviously the music industry connects with all aspects of Hollywood. Mm. And I think there's some real, real darkness in the music industry. It's the yeah. only music, music, it's the only industry that I can like fully say for certain in today's day and world is like, 100 percent sexist still and like when you think about the difference of of the kind of women that they take on and you know yeah. pu push out and the way that they push these women out compared to the men like yeah you're still it's, seeing that in your generation oh, yeah yeah i mean it's, it's a lot better like it is a lot it's a lot less obvious i should say it's a lot less obvious because before it was like especially in the 2000s like it was Beyonce and, and the Pussycat Dolls or whatever they're called with you know and really just intense like I not know. divine it's, feminine <laughs> and it's then just the, the all, guy it's just yeah. all flipped on its head it's just um interesting we'll go back to the Glastonbury story so you know that was in the times when feminists were making music you know, and 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 women of power like Jodie Mitchell and uh, oh, there was loads of artists. They had a had a voice. You know, they were singing about femininity and singing about you know being a feminist. But you don't hear that anymore. Mm. And interestingly enough, we'll just we'll just go back to the Glastonbury trail and the spiritual connection with music it's interesting that that trail that goes from through shaftesbury and because they used to come through stonehenge through the uh, the a303 down through and then they sometimes stop in salisbury which is a sacred sacred space and then shaftesbury which is a sacred space and then glastonbury which is a sacred space which is all the same trails that the ancient kings took so that's where king arthur came that's where merlin all came they all took that that was the spear of purpose glastonbury and shaftesbury king canute died in shaftesbury on a spiritual what they used to call the holy grail which is basically just looking for ascension um it's not a cup of jesus's blood but that's another story so they were those people were obviously connected to that mm. and that's why they were doing it they may not have known that they were doing it but they're following that ancient path which mm. goes back to what you were saying just a minute ago about song lines for indigenous people we know in our soul that's kind of what they were doing they were following a song a song line to get to a music festival which had a spiritual enlightenment at the end of it for them for many mm. years because Pilton Festival I think it ran for sort of 20 years before it got really commercial so that's interesting that um interesting point which brings us all I back have a question that. for you from our viewers um somebody wants to know we can't see their names in the feed but um somebody has asked they want to know where the punks of their youth went because they were against this very thing, the establishment. So do you have any comments on that question? Well, Johnny Rotten what said What happened the same to all thing. the punks? 
Well, Johnny Rotten said the same thing just a couple of weeks ago. He kind of said um, the left has gone right and the right has gone left. Um, you, the music industry, you're not allowed to, you can't, because of the control with the industry, the music industry and the media being working hand in hand, which I know personally because I, when I did The Voice, they silence those people. They don't, they're not interested in uh, in people speaking up against the government, the Queen, the the regime, the banks. The, it just never happens. That I'm sure there are bands somewhere in garages and basements and little venues here and there around the globe, especially probably in the um, Eastern Bloc countries, you know what I mean, that in, in those places where they're pretty oppressed. But you just never, you won't hear it. The industry was very brave in the 60s and 70s. And if there was money involved, they they would take the risk. They go, I don't care. There's bad language. It, this is a going against the establishment. The managers and industry types, A&R people, would love it and take the risk if it was going to sell, sell and connect with people. Mm. And now they don't care. They couldn't care. Yeah. So they're not taking the risks anymore? No, not at all. Yeah, and, and the music industry holds so much more power now. Like the, mm. the artists don't hold. I mean, they create. Since digitalization. Yeah, they create mm. the music. Uh, well, not all they of them. They create the content. They, they create They create it. the content, but they have to go through like process after process of after process of of managers and the music, you know, whoever their record label is of approving it. And it's it's up to the label at the end of the day it's not up to the artist like i my they're promoting so so uh, uh music companies are now promoting mu the music the song itself rather than the artist and what the artist stands for mm. so yeah. artists that don't have that freedom mm. to take a stand or to yeah. have a, have their voice it's about what they look like and about what kind of songs they're singing and mm. the content of their songs and yeah. things like that. And that's why we don't have amazing fan bases for and, and communities like there was in the 80s with Queen. Yeah, because people and, don't yeah. buy albums anymore. No. They don't because yeah. an album is like a story, isn't it? It's like a, right. a whole storybook, whereas now we're buying singles. Mm. And you buy when because you, when of digitalization. you buy an album. You're buying it. You're buying the emotion that the, the the stress mm. and the emotion that went into recording that record. Sometimes it would have been elated. Sometimes it, the, the the record might be aggressive. It might be panicky. You get caught up in it all because of the pressure that that artist or band was in at that time of writing it. They may have mm, been going right. through a spiritual spiritual awakening themselves, like some of the Beatles records and some of the Zeppelin stuff. And you can feel it and connect into that. And the punk, I mean, uh, I was never a fan of punk music, but speaking to the person that's asked that question. The that was Wendy, bit, by the way. Oh, was it? Wendy Simpson. <laughs> yeah, thank um, you for that, Wendy. But the Sex Pistols, for example, they were such a good band, a very underrated band with a voice of London at that time. Um, questioning the monarchy, questioning who are these people representing, what is going on with the banking system, and not scared to say so, and saying it on TV. Yeah. You know, they got thrown off every TV channel that they went to. Actually, they got the Sex Pistols. This is a great story. They they signed they signed one of the biggest record deals. Uh, in history at that time because of the excitement around them. They went into their record label office and had a massive party and something happened with one of the members of the band and one of the 
executives of the record label they would and the next day they got dropped they got fired from that record label for their antics that's how scary they were and they got picked up literally three days later they had to sign another deal with another company they got fired <laughs> they, they didn't care it would never happen now and then you, you lick have people... the record companies butts you know well, thank mm. you for and then you have people, Yeah. You have people like the Beatles who were making songs like Across the Universe where it has like literal mantras, like spiritual mm. mantras. Mm. I don't know if it was a Hindu or if it was, you know, what culture mantra, you know, where it was from. And just, I mean, let it be, you know, all these like spiritual enlightening songs and mm. then – all of a sudden, like they got, you know, killed off a couple of them. Yeah, John Lennon was assassinated. Um, yeah, I mean, you never, you know, you never know the story behind that. I mean, it, yeah, maybe, maybe it was a crazy, enraged fan, or maybe it was, you know, we don't know the the truth of it just because we're being told a story. Well, we know he was silenced. Yep. Mm. He couldn't talk anymore after that, could he? Yeah. Totally. Yep. And, and like, when you really think about it, the Beatles, are, I would say, would be more, at that time, more have more power than the government. Yeah, influential. I mean, they were bigger than One Direction when One Direction was at its peak. Oh, yeah. Um, for years. I, One Direction was at its peak for five minutes compared to the Beatles. Oh, my God. I've heard a crazy story about um what's the what's the beetle that's still alive and um, Paul, McCartney. Paul McCartney. McCartney they so one of the beetles I don't know which one but there's there's this story that um one of the beetles actually went out and sent this voice recording of themselves telling this story to um, it was either, uh, I don't know who we were sending it to, but someone got access to this voice mem voice recording. And it's him mm. talking about the story of how Paul McCartney actually died and was replaced by a lookalike and the lookalike yes. got yeah, plastic that. surgery. No, but the reason why. Really? Yeah, but the reason why. I've now, this is, yes, this is a conspiracy. But the reason why they did this is because they were so influential. If they announced on the news that Paul McCartney had died, there would be mass suicide by oh, their fans. That's me. what they believed. And this is this is I anything's mean, possible, I guess. Look, anything's possible. I know it's a conspiracy, and it sounds. <laughs> I've crazy. never heard it before. Yeah, I haven't until recently. But there's a documentary on it, and I'm going to watch the documentary it because right. it, it sounds really interesting. I mean, you never know, and I'm really interested. Yeah, you in never these, know. I'm interested in these crazy stories because. I want to believe that these crazy <laughs> stories are real. <laughs> like, you know, that we're living on this movie. Well, that was the, that's, that's, that's the power of, uh, of music right there. That's, that's, yeah. that's how influential it was. Um, yeah. And they know that. The powers that be, the banking industry, the, the music industry, the, the media, they know how powerful it is. You only have to look at what. The craziness of Elvis Presley, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, the private jets, the the emotions that 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 people feel for another artist and for songs. So it's so powerful. Mm. It, I mean, it it's is. a weapon. It's a weapon, really. If if you if you to be perfectly blunt, I mean. At the peak, the Beatles could have done anything and um, people would have bought it, you know. And the same with many bands, same with Elvis, you know. Uh, I mean, his story. Yeah, well, was Elvis was gyrating on TV. I know. And lots of people thought that was a weapon. The work of the devil. Yes. He's just gyrating yeah, actually, his hips, for yeah. God's sake. And there's, yes. a, there's the Elvis movie out now. I want to go watch that, actually. Yeah, we should. That would be a really I think interesting everybody should movie go to and watch. See that. It, it, it'll be very. Mm. I, I I hope they, 
I hope they shed it in good light and there's some honesty in there. And, you know, because he was he was pulled from pillar to post, the poor guy. His manager was a nightmare and um, he got made to do those movies. He never wanted to do those yes. movies. Um, That's very well known, actually, that he, he was made to do them and he didn't want to do it. He, he felt like an idiot when he was doing yeah. them. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's definitely a, a go see movie, you know? Yeah, someone someone also mentioned Dolly Parton. Um, we don't see names on this streaming platform, just comments. But someone mm. said Dolly Parton, and that's someone I really want to talk about because yeah. she was an icon. Like she yeah. was that same vibe of Elvis where everyone was like, it's a mark of the devil because mm. she had this crazy hair, all this makeup, ginormous bosoms <laughs> you know like she was really out there and wearing like the most skimpy outfits at the time she's got and bosoms she that get bigger mm. Mm. they and were she, her trademark she made them that way yeah mm. but she didn't care what other people thought she mm. truly didn't care i mean maybe behind closed doors she might have had some you know she might have cared but on her interviews and you know outside appearance she didn't give. She got entertained by it. She mm. was entertained by it. She she found it as comedy for her, mm. and that well, is. Doing... Sorry, what did you say? I, you. I said it's interesting that someone's brought up Do Dolly Parton because we've we've kind of been poo pooing the industry and saying that, uh, you know, when we grew up in the UK or in Australia, we had you know, rock, and we had those, the 80s had this look and the 90s had this look and the grunge and the, you know what I mean, and then it all started to fizz out. There's one genre that's always seems to have, because of middle America. Mm, stayed the same, it, stayed the same. It's got very, very much commercialised, but country music, uh, a friend of mine, Dennis Fowles, just got back from, from Nashville and he says that, the scene is very much alive and well, and people go out and see their favourite country artists from little from little duos in the pubs to you know the big corporate arenas. So it, I have to sort of backtrack a little bit because the the country music scene in America only really in in, in those in those in the South is very much alive and well. And um, people are very connected to it. They like mm. that basic storyline. It's a, it's a, you know what I mean. We, however the storyline is, but it's fundamentally about being American and living on the land and having fun and dancing and drinking Tennessee whiskey and all that stuff. So and I mean, and their stories from the heart. That's yeah. how I view Basic living. Um, country music. It's it's yeah. very much written through the artist. That that's the voice of the artist and um, telling stories about their life from the heart. That's how I yeah. view country music. Might not be the style that I like to listen to, but I really mm. do enjoy that heartfelt aspect. Yeah. You can of, appreciate, yeah, without, yeah. You know. I, yeah, I I appreciate that heartfelt felt aspect yeah. of country music. And that's yeah, that's so that's one genre that's very very well and alive, and it has been infiltrated and it's very commercialised. But but um, it it does have a it does seem to have a spirit, and uh, mm. it's kind of lived on, which is a very positive thing. And mm. we can all learn yeah. from that in the industry. We can all go right. Yeah, okay, what is so country let's, music? Let's hope. Yeah, what did country music do that other people, the other, you know, genres didn't do? You know, what, what sets it apart? What makes country music? I don't think it was taken seriously. Mm. I think, yeah, I don't think it was taken seriously. So it was just and kind of brushed like, away. Well, like, I think it was preserved because it didn't get attention, yeah. <laughs> you know. And, and that surprises me because country music is huge in the States. Mm. It's yeah. absolutely massive in the States and it makes like billions of dollars a year. Mm. So the fact that it has, has been preserved, well preserved, maybe not perfectly preserved, but well preserved is surprising. The, tes mm. 
to, it's a testament to the American people that is really. Mm. Yeah. Because they, uh, they're the ones buying it and they're the ones that go to see the concerts and they're the ones that see through the bullshit. So they're kind of like, mm. yeah, I, I, I still like this basic form of art yeah, and music and connection and getting out and singing and dancing with my mates and having a what do they do walk the line or whatever it is. So yeah, it's, that's really cool that that's you know. So that I mean I don't really know much about Dolly Parton, but she's part of that um, story. Mm. So she's she's testament to um, to helping that genre of music sort of last. Yeah. Through all the rubbish, you know? Yeah, I think she and was... She's written she fantastic was, songs far out. Yeah. Yeah. And she Jolene was really, song. at the time, the main person leading against... Like, she wasn't even a feminist, but she was a feminist. Mm. Like, she was true feminism of just, like, being yourself and not caring yeah. what other people yeah, she and was my true. introduction to country music. Yeah, and she yeah. was the really the only person I can think of in my limited knowledge that overcame the feminism in in um, sorry the sexism in the music industry, like because she was so successful. And yeah, she got a lot of hate, and she obviously had some big obstacles, mm. but she still succeeded so greatly through through you know the sexism of of the society at the time and also the music industry because i think the music industry kind of wanted to turn her style into like sexualization mm. and and they did a bit but but the difference here is like dolly actually was just being herself and she mm. likes the yeah. way of looking like that mm. and if yeah. you like the way of looking like that then look like that yeah and right. it was she wasn't looking like that for other people, like how you see, you know, today. Like, well, her personality and her boobs didn't go together, did they? Because she was so sweet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, it was like this juxtaposition of her of her sweetness, and and she was so feminine, so feminine in the way she yeah. spoke and the way she held herself, and then these bazookas that were like bazookas so were in your face sexualized yeah. and it was it, it, i've i really enjoy that she um she, she kind of like that. used them as a weapon didn't she yeah. to yeah. she was hiding behind those it was like her boobs would come into the room first and then she would follow and yeah. then when you kind of got over that initial shock of gosh how big are those boobs and you started listening to her and you started to pay attention to who she was as a person, then you kind of went, now I feel bad for, mm. it was like, check yourself. Like, oh, she's yeah, not because she was a, she's, she's a, a, she's a clever person. and sensitive songwriter too. She writes, yeah. writes sensitive pro, uh, subjects and she's very clever in the songwriting. So um, yeah, that's why I kind of like that old country music. It's a little bit more clever than the modern country sort of Keith Urban stuff. It's all very predictable. You find but, it uh, more obvious. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of cool old country. So there's some good new country artists like Stapleton and you know that Tennessee whiskey song. It's a great song. But yeah. Interesting. Mm. Next. Yes. <laughs> what did you say next? <laughs> well let's put it to the audience. If you have yeah. any questions, other questions for, that you'd like yeah. us to cover, please ask. Yes. So let the comments roll in. Well, um, yeah. I, I think the people that I really like in today's um, music industry are ones that don't have big record yeah. labels. Yeah. I think there's more scope now with platforms like YouTube and Spotify, um, I mean, as much as it takes power away from the earning potential of an artist because, you know, they only get, you can speak to this, Spence, because you know you only get a few cents per download, the you artist. Get you get zero. The, the plat so you get fractions of cents. You get 0 0.00 
two six of a cent per stream per download no per stream there's right. no downloads anymore mm. yeah that's right. why that's why street that's why the industry loves the streaming thing because you, you need you need like um you need like three billion streams to to make 15 grand or something yeah right so, so where is all the money going exactly mm. that's going question, somewhere isn't it yeah Oh, someone's asked to hear you sing, Dad. Or do you play hey. an instrument? Do you play an instrument? I play guitar and I play the the harp. And I can play the drums. But I'm not very good. <laughs> you can bang a stick. I, my first <laughs> my, wow. exactly. My first instrument, believe it or not, was the cornet. That's how I Really? I, I didn't know that. I know. I was just, I wrote some notes down. I wrote, yeah. but every I child played, in Australia is the recorder. But then I learned the flute, remember? Yeah. I played the corner in the school band and used to, we'd go up and down Shaftesbury High Street playing like Oh When the Saints and all that stuff with the, you know. I thought you were, I thought you played the bass. No, well, that was my introduction into rock music, but I, I, I would have been. I would have been nine or ten years old when I played the cornet in the school band right. with a little music sheet on the end of it and you'd read the notes. Yeah. Can you play it now, Sven? Do you play the cornet could. still? I reckon I could. <laughs> you don't ever I forget could. something like that, surely. No. And then, yeah, and then I was a, a bass player in the school rock band and then, uh, then I tried the drums in the school rock band. And then we couldn't find a singer and I was kind of the only guy that could kind of sing that was in pitch because I was in the primary school choir. My mum mum was going to try and send me to the Wells School Cathedral where, where it's a very famous um, choir school. It's where Alad Jones, remember Alad Jones? Yep. That's where he went to school. But they couldn't afford to send me there, unfortunately. Um, so, so that was my introduction to singing. Was basically, I had to do it because nobody else could. <laughs> <laughs> so then I kind of put the bass. I could. I struggled playing the bass and singing at the same time. So then I kind of, yeah, morphed into the lead singer. At that point. So when in your mind, when did you start to really come into your own as a singer? How old were you? Not until a bit later because uh, I kind of grew up in that glammy rock phase where it was all about just looking good and singing as high as you could. So I never kind of considered myself a singer. It wasn't until later that I was in bands with, I was always the youngest member of sort of more serious rock bands and they, they were always 10 years older than me or five years older than me, should I say. And I'd be like, oh, you gotta, you gotta sing like this guy, you gotta sing like that guy. And then I start to listen to sort of uh, Paul Rogers and David Coverdale and all those kind of really good rock singers and I go I can't sing like that so that's when I really had to lift my game and started to practice and that would have been in the that would have been in the sort of late 80s late 80s early 90s I just practiced 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 all the time I, I used to over sing and I and then I'd wake up and I couldn't speak so I f then I found my little sweet spot, and uh, yeah, that's kind of how I learned to sing. I went for one singing lesson, and the lady put a book on my head <laughs> and made me sing like an opera singer. <laughs> I was just like, this is not for me. So I used to just, I used to just, just to gig a lot, you know. So my practice came from sort of gigging and, and listening to other vocalists and then finding my voice within myself i over sang for for a while and then i'd over 
under sing and it's just like there's a little sweet spot in everybody you know you, you find your own voice mm. and you the only way you can do that is just is to do it you know mm. so tell us about tell us a little bit about your time on on the voice australia tell us how did you stretch yourself did you learn anything do you, do you think it, you were a better person after it? A better singer, maybe? Yeah, I became a better singer after The Voice because I, I learned how to... That whole show is about connection. And um, there was times in the show I didn't realise that and there was times in the show where I did realise that and they they put a lot of pressure on their subjects uh within the within the show so sometimes you you forget to connect because you're so busy with hair and makeup and being pushed and pulled and being such support to some of these younger kids that are getting fucking annihilated you know um by the beast you know they're getting there's these poor girls that are on there for example that they'll put them in the hair and makeup for hours five hours and then you do you shoot that show kind of not not from the beginning but you kind of you shoot it backwards so if you leave they've got everything and if you mm. and they shoot it in a way that uh a yes can be a no and a no can be a yes there's i can't remember what they call it now but it's, it's how they edit it it's it's pretty clever so then, they, they, you know, they get these poor girls in hair and makeup, and they go, "Oh, we need we need a few tears. We need we need some drama." And then they dress them up, and then we do the walk-ins and the walk-outs for the that segment of the show. And then they'll come and say, "Oh, they, the producers don't like the look. You know, they don't like the makeup and the dress. We have to do it all again." So this poor girl's now got to sit in hair and makeup again for another five, six hours. So how and did then, how did this experience affect you? How how have you walked away from it? That's what my question is. Um, yeah, I I became a better singer. Uh, I learned how to connect. I mean, I I I left the show through a a performance where I didn't connect, but I chose to take the the positives from because I should have been thrown out of the show a long time before, but then. I kind of lifted my game when I sang Skyfall by Adele. It was my that point in the show where I was supposed to leave. And I kind of had this warrior fight in me that went, I, I'm not fucking leaving. I'm not ready to go yet. And uh, I sang that song with everything I had. And the producers, and I think the show at that point said, he can't leave. And they, you know, the systems went down, the iPads blew up and yeah, all that I remember. Stuff. And mm. uh and it was just like, oh, we we saved him. And I felt that that, that they, they manipulated that and, and kind of made that happen a bit for me because mm. of what because of the connection that I brought and although you can't find it on YouTube because they, they didn't get clearance and all that stuff, but um that was a turning point for me. It was just like music is about connection and it's about, mm. you know what I mean? It's So that's that's what I learned from it. And put your heart and, and soul into it. Yeah, put your heart and soul into it. And, and also I, I learned to kind of deal with my nerves a lot better than, than, uh, than before doing the show. It was kind of, I, I, I kind of had to, look at myself from the, the anxiety side of me and the behaviors around that mm. so that I, that's what the major things I, I took out of that is connection sit finding that sweet spot in my voice and, and and connecting even if it's a cover song just bringing myself to it and trying to connect with the audience and also just dealing with my my anxiety around myself in those situations. So, mm. 
and I kind of helped others in that room there that I was known as Uncle Spen, you know, because <laughs> a lot of those, a lot of the younger artists were kind of coming to me for help. And little did they know that I was throwing up in the fucking bin before I was <laughs> going on stage, but I kept that to myself, so I didn't want them to, you know what I mean? Hmm. But yeah. Wow. So you had some personal growth out of the experience. Yeah, for sure. 100%. On, on a personal a positive, level. Yeah, it was a positive experience. It, it, was, it was a hard experience and it had negative undertoes. But um, I'd recommend anyone kind of to do it, to, to you know, because you're kind of forced into uh, – into, uh, into into growth you know it, it, mm. it really does it really does help you in that way and if yeah. you can go there in the right frame of mind and kind of go okay i want to learn and i want to it's just a microchasm of the industry it's that mm. that's the whole thing that's very clever it's There's a concentrated the, version it's a concentrated version of what is happening on the outside but you're in this bubble, you you get your little key card, you're locked in, you can't get in, you can't get out. It's like going to jail. It's like going to the voice jail or whatever. <laughs> but you've got the media side of the contract, you've got the record side of the contract, and they're completely separate, which is exactly the same as how these mega artists operate on the outside. They've got their music contracts, they've got their they've got their media contracts with tv with coca-cola and all the yeah, tie-ins and, and, yeah. it's, it's just the same it's just, but it's just a very small version of it and it kind of just gives you a bit of an insight as to how if you want to be part of that big corporate version of it that's what you've got to do you know what i mean it's, mm. it's just like that's just how it is so if you don't want to be part yeah. of it don't sign up for it. It's, mm. it's 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 right there, all in plain sight. So it's very it's very empowering for me. It was so. I'm still trying to. I still try and cipher through parts of it all. I'm still dealing with what I want to do. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a positive thing. You can uh, you know you can. You can see the negative side of it all, which, which it kind of, you know what I mean. I think we're all in that space with that, with the with the media and within the music industry right now. But you can, you can turn it into a positive. So, or you can you can carve your own path. You like, yeah, that's right. You just go right. I learn from that, and so yeah, so that's good. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. I I learned a lot today. Yeah. From this. Oh, so I hope you do. Um, oh, yeah, we had fun. So will you come back again? You can have me again? anytime you want. You know that. And I'll have some <laughs> questions for you guys maybe next time. Yeah, cool. Amazing. Everyone. And, uh, yeah, your complete? listeners have, yes, some, have we're some. complete. Thank you. All right. We'll go. Peace out. Okay, Thank see you. See you in like two new seconds. <laughs> when you leave the room. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Bye. 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 Bye to all your listeners.